Hello, friends. I hope you are all doing well today. I will start the broadcast now and monitor the activity closely. Today is Friday, and I am excited to share some interesting updates with you. The office is already quite empty. Everyone has scattered and is working from home. Yes. By the way, as you can see, you may observe that we have this Zeppelin airship, which, in particular, Pavel brought from Germany. Today, I will share a few interesting updates and news about what happened this week, what will happen next week, and I will answer your questions. You probably have a question about where all the guests, the technical guests, are at work. We will have the Scientific and Technical Council on Monday and everyone is preparing for it. Today, drafts of several documents were prepared and sent to everyone for review before Monday. On Monday, there will be a large council with 15 people, including specialists from other jobs, universities, and institutes. I will tell you more later. To be more precise, as I will explain later, we will film everything, of course. We will cut out some parts and keep others. We will gather the traces, after the council to explain it, and we will post it. Check it out. Yes, you can start writing questions right away. I see there are not many people. On Friday evening, at 7 p.m., it's a bit of an experiment. I don't really like it myself. In general, what's new? We're settling into the office. We received the complete seating arrangements from the designers, specifications for the premises, specifications for the offices, and for the equipment. Their office is already fully furnished, but they are still working from home because there are still some minor issues with the internet. There are problems. He is absent here. But for now, I am using mobile internet. On Monday, there will be a shared internet connection. And this was all because the designers need not only internet access, but also a server, a computing station, and their workstations, which were planned for the project. Well, it was necessary to develop all of this in order not to have to change it later. So today, everything has been officially approved. And starting from Monday, we will definitely have internet and there will be people who will no longer be forced to stay at home. Today, we discussed the server requirements, what power is needed, and what computing equipment is necessary. The equipment needed for mathematicians is different from that required for graphic work, and all of this must be coordinated with each other. In fact, I'm a bit shocked that such a powerful computing machine will appear here, and it will be used not only by the Zeppelin airship operators, but also by some external guys. It turns out, there are interested parties. When the IT specialists found out our plan, they said, wow, cool, and there is even more. It can also be applied. In general, it's interesting. So we will certainly get everything ready for the IT team here by next week. Building a computational server will take, I think, a couple of months because the technical assignment they issued is really difficult to fulfill under the current conditions with sanctions. The processors that are under sanctions, but the IT specialists said they would figure it out and find everything, so don't worry. They are good guys. There was also a task regarding software. There is really a lot of software out there. I don't know. There are about 10 or 11 Russian names, and the rest are foreign. They say all the foreign ones are under sanctions, and the IT specialist says, Well, that's good. We know how to hack them, and no one will come to check. So we will save money. Overall, significant progress has been made this week on the stratospheric vehicles, with work being conducted in three directions. One team is focused on the communication system for the stratospheric vehicles, while another is working on what is called ballast management.
specifically the active ballasting of the stratospheric vehicle, to change its altitude, allowing it to catch the right wind and remain in one position while moving. And work on these shell materials for long-lasting devices has been delayed due to ongoing research efforts. Not exactly from a dead point, but from an absolute zero point. Very soon, there will indeed be something to show and to tell, in any way. I think the first materials will appear next week at all. A little briefly about this scientific and technical council that will be held here in the office on Monday. There will be specific, detailed, and comprehensive technical specifications for the initial device in the series. The technical specifications will be for such products, at what distance, what cargo, using which engines, what technical appearance, what fuel systems will be there, what controls, and how will it all be managed. There will be two sentences in total. We are at the present moment forming everything from them. A solution has been put together specifically for this, and that's why we need the Council. So, if we agree on Monday, we will discuss which specific aircraft we will build and launch into the air over the next year. But for now, what I said earlier still stands, and it won't change. The size will be such that it can fit through the standard gates of the aviation hangar, which are 12 meters by 12 meters. It will be available in two versions, optionally piloted and fully unmanned, and that is already 100% confirmed. It will be powered by a gasoline engine, either 98 or 100 aviation gasoline. Currently, there are two engine options available, one German and one Chinese, which can be purchased and installed. If it's indeed German, then it will act as the procession-like engine itself. In this configuration, it is likely to be an optionally piloted or even passenger version. If it's a Chinese engine, it will be more high revving, acting as a generator, and with electric motors, it will be a drone. We will work out two such schemes, but they are still preliminary for now. If we come to some common ground and sign on Monday, then, currently, at this stage. We will adjust all these presentations and there will be something to show and talk about. What other news is there? I don't really know, to be honest. Work is progressing. There is a lot of work. I'm bustling around. Everyone is bustling. Everyone is working. There isn't even time to prepare for the webinars, so I apologize. We will start preparing sometime. Oh, by the way, the laboratory has started to take shape over there. In the laboratory, there are its initiators who say, we definitely need one, two, three, four, five, ten. This includes both the materials for their testing, verification, and various coatings on these materials, including solar panels. And, in general, some. Well... The welding of the shells, that's clear. In general, it's being organized over there right now. We'll show how it's being organized. What else? God knows. In fact, the work is progressing. Everything is fine. I'm reading your ideas about flying cities. It's very nice that people's imagination is reaching a new level. And most certainly, most likely we will get there, together. In our shared bright future. I can speak about the wing structure myself. The wing structure is the same three-dimensional, but it will be inverted on that very first apparatus. This is precisely to ensure that it can pass at height. The upper parts are made here, and their height is not limited. It will be turned like this, so that the gate can fit through. There will be a lot of both classical and non-classical things. 
Let's see. Overall, I'm ready to answer questions. Today is Friday evening. The cleaner has arrived. Hello, Anna. We are live and excited to share with you what is planned to be shown. By the end of this year, we have a lot of exciting content and events lined up that we believe you will find interesting and engaging. By the end of this year, we will launch three stratospheric vehicles to test the communication system, to practice active ballast control, and to conduct several scientific experiments. This will be done by the end of the new year. By the end of the new year, we will have fully formed the technical appearance of this device, which is being discussed by the Scientific and Technical Council. It is quite likely that by the end of the year, well, not entirely likely, not exactly, work will begin. Well, calculations, modeling, and so on. We will show everything, showing how it is progressing and in which direction laboratory will be available on Steam. Will we manage to launch the Zeppelin airship? We will launch the Zeppelin airship within a year. Well, from this moment on, closer to autumn at its beginning. If we launch it at the beginning of autumn or the end of summer, it means we have worked really hard and quickly, and everything will be wonderful. If we launch it within a year, it means there were some difficulties, but there will definitely be no difficulties, because the Zeppelin airship has been equipped to the maximum extent, quickly and clearly. In general, we didn't incorporate any super innovations or really advanced technology or know-how into the first drone, except for the control system the fact that it will be unmanned, and the automatic docking system. Essentially, this means that no people will be needed in the design and development. As the economy shows, the more people the Zeppelin airship serves, the higher the cost of its flights, transportation, parking, and so on. Therefore, it involves automatic docking, automatic undocking, and automatic route following. For the most part, the automation, autopilots, and so on, will be tested. Control system. But, there will be no unique engines. Or unusual technical designs on the first device. Essentially, the first device will be 100% flying, and 100% reliable. The only thing is this is a management system. It will be new, and there has never been anything like it before. It is quite possible that the first device even in its version with the very Chinese engine and electric motors, will be able to operate and replace the engine with hydrogen cells. Then it will indeed be the world's first 100% eco-friendly hydrogen fuel cell Zeppelin airship. Well, this is certainly possible. Yes, indeed, it is possible. And all of this will most likely be done. When is the 200-tonner planned to be built? Look, we are building this device in a year. For the first six months, we focus on designing it. In the second six months, we assemble and launch it. This is when we start gathering and launching. The team of designers is released and begins to design. The next device will likely be closer to 10 tons, and the air will likely rise from the moment it starts being designed. Well, in approximately two to two and a half years, also, in six months, to a year, once they start designing it, the next device will be laid down. Most likely, somewhere around approximately 40 tons. Well, you see, that is 200 tons. And the air will rise if we consider such sequences. Probably in about six or so. Perhaps. Maybe a little longer. 200 tons is already a very serious apparatus. We were just sitting and rereading a book called Military Airships. In 1870, a Brazilian built an airship, just like the one we are going to assemble according to those dimensions. 
He installed electric motors and batteries. And the electric motors and batteries weighed about 280 kilograms or so. The electric motor was only three horsepower, and he flew around the Eiffel Tower in Paris with it. It was some year in 1870, and we are looking at the fact that if such devices were built 120 years ago, then perhaps we can build a 200-ton one even faster with our current level. The development of technology and techniques. But for now, I don't want to say much. Let's see how it actually goes because many decisions are made on the fly in modern times. We have strengthened the very design team of talented developers with young, modern technologists, engineers, and designers, and solutions come on the go. They thought we would do it this way, but in reality, we can also, in general, Modularity has been added, new materials have been introduced, and the technology for producing these modular structures will most likely be much faster. Here is the first rigid apparatus we will be assembling. We will work through all of this, and then, who knows, we might develop such modular structures that 200 tons of these modules could be assembled, not in six years, but in four years, conditionally. Regarding the connection of the drones, with the control program, how stable it is, there will also be a redundancy system. Just yesterday, I spoke with our IT specialist at Solar, an Iranian named Milad. He works with artificial intelligence, big data, and so on. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It is involved in projects and it has a team there that develops systems based on machine vision, artificial intelligence, and so on, which allow a drone or helicopter to orient itself and determine where it is and where to go next when it loses connection. There will be classic systems, such as navigation, route following, and so on, and there will also be this duplication by artificial intelligence, so, if the connection is lost, nothing will happen to the Zeppelin airship. We will also implement this on the very first device. On the first device, we will specifically work on the brains, the control system of the Zeppelin airship, and then the airship will be scaled up, while overall the brain just becomes smarter, smarter, and so on. In general, I absolutely think there won't be any problems with the connection. We are going to test the communication system for the stratospheric team. We will combine it and an opportunity to set up our own ground stations. Well, their range is up to 500 kilometers. With such ground stations, it is possible to cover the proposed routes and definitely not depend on anyone, knowing for sure that you will have communication. And if it suddenly doesn't exist, either an optionally piloted Zeppelin airship, where a person can figure it out, or in the case of its absence, artificial intelligence. So, Approximately how many Zeppelin airships will be produced per year after the construction of the two hangars? It all depends on a multitude of numerous factors. Initially, we planned that each hangar would be minimally capable of producing one unit per month. So far, we haven't deviated from this course. Naturally, we need more. More than 12. In the hangars, between 12 to 25 units were planned to be built per year. That is, either one per month or two per month. But since we are currently on the way, we are currently reviewing the technical appearance and specifications of the Zeppelin airship because a lot of people have gathered, many experts, not only airship pilots, but also economists and businessmen, administrators, in general, we consider this process not just as an aerial or logistical one, 
but from multiple perspectives, and the technical appearances change because of this, the applicability changes, and the serial production may change as a result. Here is the Zeppelin airship that is currently being built first. According to rough estimates, the demand will be around 100 units. According to the most pessimistic estimates, the demand will be around 100 units for such devices. And the question of how many will be produced per month or per year will again depend on the activity of this demand. Well, and from the ability to sell it, naturally, the faster we sell it, the more we will build. For now, we keep in mind that at least 10 units will be produced per year, ideally 12, but we can also organize 50 if needed. We will calculate the larger devices later, but preliminarily, we are planning a minimum of 12, ideally 25. This is a very rough economic model, and even this device will be compared in terms of economics and cost. I will talk a bit later about the type of work that can be done with existing helicopters, mentioning that the cost will be lower and the specifications will be better than those helicopters. I already know that more than a thousand of them have been sold just in the region we are considering, and by the roughest estimates, at least 100 of these machines will definitely be needed, both as replacements for these helicopters and simply as a novelty. But in reality, a Zeppelin airship is quite a thing, especially if it is a functional, unmanned one. It will sell itself, and will have even more demand. So, what about the Northern Ring, where the wind moves in a circle? What is the height there? The height is about 20 kilometers, or rather, it starts from 20 kilometers and goes higher. I could check it exactly right now, but then I wouldn't be able to see your comment. To discern, let me send you the website. This website is publicly accessible. There is a model for the predicted winds. You can set the altitude, rotate the planet, and see which winds are going where and at what altitude. And at a certain altitude, starting from 20 kilometers, this stable ring current begins. Its diameter is large. It reaches somewhere. If you look from the North Pole, it surely reaches St. Petersburg. Here, you can take a look at the details and count for yourself to verify the information. But who is the main person responsible for leading and managing this project? Who is the boss, the one in charge of making all the important decisions? Dad is a Russian engineer, a Russian manufacturing entrepreneur and skilled. In fact, the team is large. We are simply organizing it, while the talents are everywhere, in various fields. Dad, I think he'll figure it out himself. For now, well, how should I put it? The Americans have a good model, and we rarely followed it before. We mean, there, Russia, the CIS, and so on. The management model, the business structure model, and so forth. It was a matrix. Well, they have a matrix structure. It's project-based. This has become somewhat habitual for us. It originated from the Soviet Union, and Russia adopted the structure where one manager has three deputies, and each deputy has three more deputies. And if you are standing above a person, you tell them what to do. You are smart, and they are not really. It is considered somewhat the opposite here. The specialist says he is smart, while you are just literally assigning this work. And while in the project, which is a complex and multifaceted endeavor, the smartest individuals, who are undoubtedly the specialists, are, of course, leading the way. However, no one is surpassing them in their expertise, so the unique and intricate design known as the batik remains a creation of a talented Russian designer. What is the difference in speed, payload capacity between Zeppelin airships and helicopter competitors? The lifting capacity is approximately the same. The Zeppelin airship even has a slightly larger capacity. The speed of the Zeppelin airship is slightly lower. Well, there's a difference. I can't say for sure right now, so I won't mislead you. 
let's wait for the scientific and technical council to take place. We will definitely approve all of its technical specifications. I will then send all the checks, but it flies much further. It is two to three times safer and more economical. And it costs less. So, let's be more active with the questions. On Friday evening, my mind is a bit slow to come up with something on the spot. In fact, the difference between Zeppelin airships, helicopters, and competitors, no one is a competitor. Let's simply forget entirely about competition altogether as a word in aviation. There is a helicopter with its own tasks. There is an airplane with its own tasks and advantages. And there will be a Zeppelin airship, an additional tool. With its advantages, it is more cost-effective and budget-friendly. For example, it is more environmentally friendly, which is beneficial in many ways, but it tends to be slower. However, it can carry a larger load capacity than most alternatives, so there really isn't any competition. Otherwise, we would find ourselves positioning against someone else entirely, and people might think we are joking around. In reality, there can truly be no opposition here. It's like comparing the difference between a passenger car versus a truck vehicle. A truck simply isn't considered an actual competitor when compared directly with what's offered by passenger cars because each has its own distinct purpose and function within society today. In fact, the real question remains, who exactly holds authority or acts as the boss? Why just one? That's how it turns out. I can explain it again, because all the designers are working from home. How long has it been? Well... Starting from Tuesday, they probably met again in the office on Monday. A work plan for the week was formed, and the entire work plan was conditionally tied to the Scientific and Technical Council for making decisions about the technical specifications and external appearance of the first device. In order to work, they all scattered to their homes, and today, roughly speaking, is the last working day before Monday. Everyone is preparing the project for the defense. We are inviting external specialists for the defense. While the designers are working, we are busy with the office, furnishing their office and laboratory. Today, we were dealing with the internet and paperwork. Pavel could have actually supported me today, but he has a lot of important tasks so I'm alone today. Starting next week, we are all moving to the office. We will have internet, computers, and furniture here, and all the constructors will be here. So starting next week, it will be like this. We will be able to invite our engineers and production staff on Tuesdays. For the webinars, we should try to extract something interesting from them, even on Fridays. However, they want to move the Friday webinar to Thursday, because the attempt to hold it on Friday at 7 p.m. is not very effective. By the way, let me know how ineffective it is. In my opinion, people are out and about at half past seven in the evening, although it is raining today. Next week, the designers will be coming to the office and you can work here. It's been tough and the internet's been bad all week. This is the advantage of our airship and today's German Zeppelin airship. This one. Or the Zeppelin airship, which is simply written here in the city of Hindenburg. Today's airship is in the region of Friedrichshafen. The Zeppelin has a very special machine for mooring that approaches from the mast and catches the airship. Literally, Quite literally, people connect it with a rope. Here, too, there is a person. He is taken further by car to Wellington. This means that nothing has changed for him in terms of the near-Earth operation of those old devices. This is one, two. It is designed to comfortably and safely accommodate approximately 12 people for tourist trips, allowing them to enjoy the view. The Zeppelin airship lands 
and people literally catch it there. Two little people went out, two came in, two went out, two came in, two went out, two came in. On one hand, it's just not modern, it really feels all old-fashioned. Old-fashioned. It has no autopilots, no automatic route following. There are still pilots on board who are in control. Let's see. Right now, we will approve the technical specifications at the council. This one is bigger. Ours will be smaller, but ours will be modern. If we compare the payload capacity, this one is definitely cooler. But our next one will definitely be much bigger, significantly faster, and indeed smarter. If the Germans suddenly decide to do something, then it will make sense to compare something. Otherwise, it's just a modern prototype of the old Zeppelin airship. Our show will have a significant advantage in terms of production, as we are focusing on serial production, and we are not planning for a small scale. Therefore, the cost of this device will be much lower, making it much more accessible in the market. The Germans take a long time to build their devices, which results in them being incredibly expensive, and there are hardly any buyers. They sell one every five years at a very high price, and are pleased with that. The main advantage over German devices is that we will establish a serial production chain with a very low cost of the device, allowing us to distribute them on a large scale. Let's have more questions. Someone wrote about this recently in the chat. I saw a message pop up today saying that all the engines from Duenov are now for the Zeppelin airships. They met with the engine specialists today, so to speak, regarding the power plant which can be used through various mechanical means to directly transmit torque to the propellers. It can also turn the generator, and energy can be supplied to the electric motors through controllers. Today, they came up with an interesting coupling related to high frequency and so on, and it turned out to be very relevant. Yes, and the frequencies are suitable. We were talking specifically with the guys from the power plant. Next week, some guys, well, tough guys, who made those high-frequency super-speed generators, will come. We will probably go with them to check our almas. We'll see. If everything comes together, then it will all come together. They decided not to determine the ground for the time being and selected the first size of the apparatus in such a way that it wouldn't require building a hangar for it at all. This will save us both time and money. Efforts and will precisely expand the possibility of operating this apparatus so that it can fit into any aviation hangar. Therefore, there is no need to build a hangar for the first aircraft and we have postponed the issue of land for a while, because it is more logical, of course, to acquire our own land. I really don't want to get involved in this five-year saga of land conversion from one designation to another. So if I were to acquire something, it would most likely be land with the correct designation, which is already someone else's aerograd located somewhere. It's not that cheap and there are actually better ways to spend the money. It should be spent on getting the apparatus into the air. Then, over time, it will be possible to acquire such an asset. He will be on the company's balance sheet. That's really cool. He won't go anywhere. First of all, he's one of us, and there will be a large hangar built for the next apparatus, because the next apparatus will no longer be able to be operated. In all the hangars available, 
where Boeing planes taxi. The first one can accommodate, but the second one won't. It needs construction, and we'll sort the land. But for now, we are considering it. There is one candidate underground, and it is located in a specific area. It is an active aerograd, which is a type of advanced city. I won't name it for privacy reasons. I don't want to. We have already talked to everyone. We didn't give anyone any hopes. We were determining the area, finding out the cost, checking the status of the documents, what permissions and restrictions there are regarding height. Nearby, there may be air defense systems, or not. In general, everyone just figured things out and made a map for themselves. They identified a favorite, but didn't say anything. Because if you mention that you really like this aerograd, they will say, well then the price is going up. So, a little later, most likely in about six months when we start to shape the technical appearance of this second large device, we will already understand, at the very least, its size, its serial production, and its applicability. From that, we will choose the land, but most likely it will be the one we have selected because there are certain, not exactly restrictions, but rules that must be followed in order to license these devices. This rule states that there must be an official state experimental flight field in the nearby area. So if you open Yandex, you will most probably find the nearest aerograd, because we can count such fields on our fingers. Thus, a large amount of debris has accumulated on the slopes of Everest left by climbers. Will the dirigible be able to handle the task? If we set this task at the initial planning and conceptualization phase of the design or modernization stage of some device, I see no obstacles, although we need to thoroughly consider the winds, potential challenges, and ensure all safety protocols are adhered to. There is sometimes clear weather around Everest, so it might be possible to organize a mission, but it will be difficult. However, if everyone decides to clean the highest mountain on the planet, and if we suddenly become that intelligent and come together to do it, then it might be possible. an experiment to compare which behaves more stably in the wind. A quadcopter or a dirigible such as the system that has more brains and advanced cutting-edge modern technologies behaves more consistently and stably in the wind. Most likely at this stage it is definitely a quadcopter of course because these quadcopters, which are mass-produced for operators, are already so smart that they quickly correct themselves. And our task is to build the first dirigible exactly like this, to incorporate all the same brains and algorithms into it. It is abundantly clear that undoubtedly a lot will change there in the future, but overall, the same systems are being added. LIDAR, RADAR, even ultrasound, because when you go low, there is forest and other things below. Here, our Milat, an Iranian IT specialist, was just showing me a system that was recently developed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They launched the quadcopter. I don't remember at what speed, but it was crazy, almost 100 kilometers per hour right through the forest. And it navigated on the go, flying around the trees. It's powerful. And he was telling me about the systems in place there, how everything is arranged, and how it can be applied to dirigibles. So, the one who is resilient is the one who knows what to do when the wind blows. Our dirigible, when it understands, will then be comparable. Are the construction technologies for a hangar and a boathouse different? Is there any fundamental difference? The difference lies in the original concept. If the hangar is intended for the construction of a specific type of dirigible, 
it means that the hanger will be equipped accordingly. These are some special devices on which the dirigible is initially assembled and then it is brought out of the hanger. This is a special truss, but it's a hanger. A hanger is a hanger, no matter where it is, and it can be used for anything. It's just floors and walls. You can count it yelling as the floors and walls, but still, it is precisely its internal equipment, its mechanization, that is specifically designed for certain devices, and that is what makes it different. As for the construction technologies, they are generally inadequate. Well, it's just the internal equipment, yes, but the hangers are huge and the stadiums are huge too. Plus or minus, I think the technology for construction will be related to the stadiums, between the stadium and the hangar. As for the internal equipment, that will be more like a factory. Russian company Aerosmena announced plans to start producing dirigibles in the shape of flying saucers in 2024. Aerosmena has long announced plans and started some production. And in general, it is not just one company, but several companies usually announce that they are starting to build something, but something unusual. But it doesn't come to action. We have indeed taken on what I consider to be the most sufficiently adequate scheme. It's about doing what has already flown, just do it in a new format, with new technologies, with artificial intelligence, with sensors, with drones. And it is absolutely clear that all of this is certainly done with new materials. But it is precisely the classic shapes, because experimenting with various forms in the initial stages is extremely risky. That is indeed, you have shaky funding and an unproven, conditionally speaking, team and you immediately do something that has never been done before. The probability of success approaches zero. They even created a prototype of an air cleaner, which was a small flying saucer called Anyuta. They tried to delete the video from the internet, but the internet remembers everything, so if you Google it, you'll find it. They certainly and successfully made it, and they couldn't even stabilize it by hand using ropes let alone with engines. Everything is clear with this dirigible. It has been calculated a long time ago. However, with a classic shaped dirigible, there are considerations regarding its center of volume and center of mass, which intersect somewhere. There should be a load here, and then it will be more or less statically stable. By the way, a flying saucer, just like a dirigible, if it doesn't have a plumb line, tries to flip over like this. Well, to tip over and surface, and in order to simply stabilize it in the air so that it doesn't do that, energy has to be spent to... I completely extinguished those unnecessary moments. Plus, they can stabilize it by lowering the load very low. Then everything, it won't tip over, the load is low, but here the pendulum effect comes into play. It also becomes unstable. In the air switch, they didn't lower the cargo. Instead, they carefully stuffed the cargo directly into the plate. They place these screws in a circle, which means that the plate will definitely not be statically stable. They will have to expend energy on its stabilization. And as their small model has shown, their models do not currently work mathematically in practice. Let's see. Let them gather. They will assemble a flying saucer in the shape of a dirigible. Cool. Everyone is trying to make these flying saucers because the shape of a dirigible is long, large, and seems bulky. Everyone is trying to make it more compact and smoother. It seems to look smaller and more pleasant. But this self-enhancement is misguided in its approach. You make it less stable, but more aesthetically pleasing to the eye in a way. Cool, of course, in the process. The years will pass rapidly and swiftly. As you know, consider carefully whether to start the process of acquiring land in parallel with other work. Well, if we absolutely need to start building the boathouse within this year, at least we should obtain 
all the necessary documentation for its construction within a year in order to proceed. Conditionally, in a year, after a year, we certainly elevated this device into the air, exhaled, and then carefully began spending money on the construction of the hangar. In a year, we are unlikely to be able to purchase any agricultural equipment and properly reassign it in the documents. It will take at least three years. It's like a forecast when people say, I did it in five, then someone asks, but what if you really try? And they say, still five. Then the question comes, what if you try really hard for five? And finally, is it possible to push yourself to the limit and do it in three? Well, probably it is quite likely. It extends its duration up to approximately five years like this. But it all actually depends on the specific geographical area in which it is done and who is doing it, particularly the individual. If you ask the government for help, it will most likely happen much faster. But for that, it is necessary to demonstrate the aircraft. And therefore, I would still like to acquire something that is already ready, so that I don't have to deal with paperwork, but rather focus on the paperwork for the construction of the boathouse, because that also needs to be coordinated. Wow. And what if more land is added? We'll see. That's why we push the question back a bit. We have a small delta. We need to sort this issue out. What is the ratio of the volume of the airship to its payload capacity? Well, typically, one cubic meter lifts approximately one kilogram. That is, if it is a thousand cubic meters, it is one ton. If it is two thousand cubic meters, it is two tons. So we will have the first airship at two, maybe with a small 1,000 cubic meters. But the shell weighs something. It will weigh around. Well, there is currently a material that weighs 207 grams per square meter. The weight will be about 300 kilograms just for the shell. The superstructure is a bit heavier than the engines, and so on. And what remains for it is well, at least 500 kilograms, and we'll see maybe a little more, something like that. Have options for an inverted airship ever been considered? Where the balloons are positioned below or on the sides, and the gondola is open. The balloons were on the sides and the gondolas were in the middle. Again, there is a desire for this thing to somehow flip over. From above, below, and if it is in the middle, there are side winds, which means they are very strong. There are hybrid forms, such as, however, they are more closely associated with high-speed altitude airships. These traditional airships, on the other hand, are super efficient at low altitudes. But at higher altitudes, for example, five kilometers and beyond, the air is less dense, allowing for a variety of different speeds, such as 250 or 300 kilometers per hour, compared to 150 or 180 kilometers per hour at ground level. This is already a larger dimension, so the engines need to be more powerful. Overall speed increases with size, because as size increases, its energy capacity grows, allowing it to push itself harder. Drag does not increase cubically like its lift. It increases quadratically. As for high-altitude airships, their external appearance changes. They become more similar to airplanes, and the designs are already calculated and available, but we are not showing them yet because there are actually many of them. At least there are three types of these designs. And they, well, they already have that know-how because calculating a high-altitude, high-speed airship involves so many wind tunnel tests, its geometry, and so on. It's like Burren. They were peeking at each other. Roscosmos. Well, the Soviet space from the Americans. Then the Americans also took a look at our Lapote, and now they are making it while we are not. So the external appearance is a very secret thing because calculating its aerodynamics is crucial, and they exist, 
and there will be others. Will there be open gondolas or something like that? Not attached to the balloon. Maybe they will be. In fact, separating the gondola from the balloon is a very good solution. And they do exist. And they are on the surface. Most likely, we have probably already come to this in the chat. I just can't read everything in time. It would be beneficial if the gondola had four propellers right here. And in case of something potentially happening with the balloon, it could potentially and slightly descend from one side in quadcopter mode. And if it is detached a little lower from the body of the airship, the aerodynamics improve. It can be hung separately in a variety of ways, and then the aerodynamic properties are significantly enhanced. Either they usually stuff the gondola inside, but then there are issues with the weight distribution. Or it needs to be lowered a bit. Lowering it is the more logical option. But combining two tanks like this, two tanks like that, is most likely. Let's calculate now. We will have a very powerful computer here that will test all forms. I am already sitting here, unable to wait for this moment because it's absolutely clear that classical forms are tested and here some small angles are calculated and so on. But all this is also for a certain height, for some conditional importance of dimensions and speed. That is, if you change the model in the technical specifications for speed, it changes a bit. There is indeed a lot to consider with this form, and I want to test everything, both this and that, including radical designs. So, as soon as the powerful machine appears, we will test everything and see that it's not just words. It will be a model, and you will see. Maybe we will find something interesting. What are the main vacancies right now? For now, there are only vacancies for training pilots of airships. That's it. By the way, we were discussing someone today. In fact, all the main roles are already, well, not roles even, but functions. People have already been formed into groups or teams. Agreements and understandings have been reached and established, and some of the people, individuals or team members will settle there over time, gradually while others are currently outsourced to different locations or areas. Some are not even in this country, but the main functions, roles and responsibilities are already covered and managed at our, how should I put it, the head office or the main design center, which serves as the central hub for operations. However, there will be job vacancies such as, for example, for contract work and some others in various fields and sectors, because the main performers are already clear, some are assigned to one task and others to another. We will reveal everything later and explain who is doing what. We will run there quickly and efficiently with cameras, capturing video footage of everything and carefully and meticulously observing. It's still too early to talk about this. Someone was here. I don't remember who. We need a system administrator in the office. There is a remote option available. Everything will be done remotely. However, we are currently looking for someone to do some hands-on work. We are looking for a secretary. By the way, we are looking for a cool operator for the studio because we constantly need to shoot laboratories and so on. The solar operators are all currently busy with work, so we are looking for someone local. But if you are specifically interested in engineering and design, I doubt anything will appear before the new year. We'll see closer to the new year. Have you ever heard about the fascinating Leonov's anti-gravity engine? I have indeed. I heard that it was thoroughly tested on Earth, and somehow he even managed to arrange for it to be sent into weightlessness on some rocket but I don't quite remember. What he demonstrated there did not work at all on the ground. Here, well, supposedly it's all about the reaction force of the support. That is, as long as there is some support, any mechanism rotates. It needs something to push off from, and these are the main forces, the reaction of the support. Even the friction in the bearings and wheels is also a reaction of the support. 
which is why it moves. In the vastness of space, he did not seem to show himself at all, so he was kicked out of the factory. But people constantly change in the same enterprises, in the same ministries, and one can run through the same offices again with the same old tune. Is it permissible to place any equipment inside the airship's envelope? Inside the envelope of a rigid airship, it is even allowed to have cabins, and in general, one can walk around and observe these inflatable bags and see how they are doing. No. Indeed, there will actually be a spectacle. I just imagined it now. And was surprised. They will be placed there, of course. There will be a lot of different equipment inside, including what is called air gas systems, AGS. There are many of them. Various containers that are inflated with air pressed down on the helium containers to descend, in order to slightly adjust Archimedes' principle, such as in a controlled manner, and therefore... There are even concepts such as to install plasmatrons inside. The plasmatrons will heat the gas. In the bags, the gas is heated and the lift increases. There, for example, for super hybrid. Well, by the way, I don't know. No one talks about this anywhere. Most likely, everyone knows about it, but they don't talk about it. I mean, the airship operators, the foreign ones, in general, other companies. The fact that this can be used, it can be used. It's not really such a big deal, actually, but... It seems that no one has mentioned this before. Such equipment can be easily placed inside. But overall, you can imagine, yes, you can walk around there, you can place rooms, cabins, and they will make windows on the side. So all kinds of equipment for life support, definitely. When considering safety, it's important to note that if the internal volume is segmented in a manner similar to the sections of an orange, it can provide a safer structure. This division allows for better distribution of forces and can enhance the overall stability and safety of the design. If a bullet happened to pass through, tearing only two tanks while the others remained intact, that makes sense. The larger the device, the more segments of this orange, and that is how it will be. So, the smaller the device, the fewer sections. The larger the device, the more sections there are. Do we need to make it directly under the orange? Let's see. It seems to me that this division of the internal space into segments, sectors, and so on, can be ideally calculated by artificial intelligence, perhaps in order to carefully and accurately, with precision and efficiency, by using advanced algorithms and sophisticated techniques to achieve optimal results. Let's give him such a task and see what he draws. If he draws an orange, for example, then nature was right. In my mind, there is a vivid picture of a perfectly ideal and detailed division of the internal space for safety like how a grenade is initially divided like an orange, and then the inner seeds are separated completely. In other words, if a bullet were to pass through, it would only displace the lift gas along its trajectory, and nothing else would be damaged on the side. But here it's important to understand that the thickness of all the envelopes accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. The mass of the devices there is becoming heavier and heavier. However, for certain special devices, hypersectionality, as we might call it, will most likely be applied when it is important not to maximize the load carried, but to transport it as safely as possible under certain conditions. Are there any age restrictions to train as a dirigible pilot? Of course, provided that one is in good health. Recently, there was a question about whether a pilot who is already retired, since pilots retire early, can still be a dirigible pilot, to which the dirigible pilots replied, We only had those who worked, only retirees, aviation retirees, not exactly retirees in the traditional sense. Are there any age restrictions? We need to clarify. Uh, we have acquaintances who opened a school, 
There were some schools with a license for ballooning. All licenses were revoked. And until recently, no licenses for ballooning were issued to anyone. We have received the first, it turns out, in modern history. Well, since a certain point, of course, such a ballooning license, I will ask them to find out if there is any specific ceiling above which one cannot study. But most likely, if health is in order and the mind is functioning, there should be no restrictions at all for training as a hobbyist or a private pilot. So, overall, there are a few questions. Thank you for asking questions. It's very easy to answer them, but coming up with something from my head is just completely exhausting. I will go on YouTube and see what is happening with the questions. I just read that on Vcontacte. So guys, if you are watching on YouTube, it's better to switch to Vcontact and ask them there. It's easier for me to do that. By the way, there is a very interesting video on YouTube showing how NASA is currently assembling an extremely detailed space shuttle that is quite similar to our Soviet LAPTI. It's interesting that the guys at NASA have buried this story, while they are actively developing it on their end. Well, first of all, yes, right on YouTube. Pavel Igorevich Filipov, note that for Siberia at 19 Ugoas Moscow time, it is already midnight. Change it back to what it was at 17 Ugoas. I agree. And it's difficult, of course, on Friday evening. I want to invest. Thank you very much. Invest. Log into your personal account. Who is Batya? Batya is a Soviet person. Well, a Russian person. Although the project is international, we even have enthusiasts. It just so happened that dirigibles. It's clear that someone initiated it. In this case, it was initiated by Solar Group. But we gathered all the engineers, and they are all talented, all geniuses. Each one is a master in their field. It's funny today. During the last webinar we were looking at, well, I don't remember. I said something about five. Probably. I know of stories where a crowd was gathered specifically for a dirigible, and so, while reading this book about old military airships, well, in general, it is called the book Military Airships, but it covers the history. A Frenchman, I don't remember his name, also some year in the 1800s, he also raised funds to build his first dirigible, something like that. Someone initiated it, and everyone likes it, everyone wants it. For some reason, there have been such sentiments around dirigibles for over a hundred years. Good evening. Were the Arabs promised that they would be the first? No, the Arabs are ready to pay a lot to be first. But for now, we haven't promised anything to anyone. So, are there any planned projects before the end of the new year? Why launch some minor stratospheric projects, no? For what purpose? To prove something to someone. We could focus on the devices according to the plan. Guys, in general, the main engineering team will be focused exclusively on the devices as planned, as previously discussed. And according to the same plan, somewhere towards the end of this plan, stratospheric dirigibles, to carry out minor tasks with the help of contractors, allocating a minimum number of specialists from our workforce, and most likely not involving us at all. They will tell us, here is the technical specification for the device, or rather, they have already said it, nay. Like, learn and monitor. We need one, two, three, four. Communication, materials, welding. In general, go study. Here is the technical assignment for you. So it is not for proof. Everything is moving in that direction. 
It's just that this is such a distant perspective that we can start with small devices ourselves. And it's completely inexpensive, quick, and most importantly, everything is moving in one direction. Not in one direction, but towards one large common goal. In the future, you will consider a design with movable directional engines so that it is possible to optimally arrange the levers, exert influence, and replace a broken engine on the go. We are already considering it. There are already several concepts on how it could be implemented. And again, they all relate to prospective external appearances, in terms of their design and functionality, which, while intriguing, are better left undisclosed. But moving engines along the body of the dirigible are, of course, possible in a manner that is both efficient and aesthetically pleasing. We are considering this. It's not a fact that we will naturally use it, especially in the initial stages. As a concept, it certainly has its place. But what comes next? Calculations, experiments. At the initial stages, the fewer experiments we incorporate into the device, the greater the chance that everything will be fine with it. That's one. Moreover, the newer the solution that appears in aviation, the more difficult it generally is to get it off the ground, obtain some kind of certification for it, and so on. Even in the first device, some solutions will be certified. That is, you can take, well, I'm exaggerating a bit, you can take an aviation bolt. And when the device is being examined for what it is made of, they will say that it is an aviation bolt. They say, okay, but can you make the same bolt yourself, just from a different material, for example? And I will be asked, is it exactly the same? They will say no. Go certify this bolt. Let's get going. Testing methodology. And off we go. And that's how I feel about the bolt. The first small device will certainly already have systems that will need to be certified independently. Well, in order for them to truly make their significant and remarkable mark in aviation history, but the more of these systems there are, the more complex and costly it becomes. Some kind of engine that moves is cool, especially if the gondola will also be moving. In my head I can imagine how I would move it down there. Carefully lift the device up like this, gently bring it here, and then drive it in. But, then... They considered abandoned quarries as a hangar, especially those that taper downwards. The construction of the building is progressing well. The walls have been erected successfully, and the next step involves installing the roof. However, we have not yet taken into account the necessary considerations for this phase. To put the roof on, it lifts up like this, which is quite an interesting idea. An interesting and innovative idea. Have stratospheric airships been considered as a launch platform for rockets? Will the lift of a stratospheric airship allow for the installation of a platform for launching a booster stage with satellites? Without resistance. A stratospheric platform for launching rockets is indeed an aspiration for many, truly both in Russia and abroad. I remember someone in the chat wrote, What are you talking about? What size should the dirigible be to lift such a huge rocket? This is not about huge rockets, but rather about small solid fuel ones. Like those with CubeSats, for example, with satellites the size of a toaster. Such systems are being considered and are deemed economically viable, and their feasibility is also established. The technical implementation is currently absent at this moment, but overall the story is promising and... Many need, well, from a commercial point of view, in general, and from a technical one. Everyone wants it, everyone sees the value, whoever does it first. Even if someone else does it first, the same thing applies. The Americans have some kind of rocket, and they will never give it to us in our lifetime. In any case, we need to build our own, even if someone else builds such a thing, or if we even build it ourselves. In any case, politics will be involved, deciding who gets support and who doesn't. So there will definitely be 
two, three, or four companies engaged in this. Well, the first one there is definitely and clearly having more fun. But overall, there is absolutely a market for everyone. As for the slingshot, I don't know. Again, everything needs to be calculated. I need to set up the sling. The first spacecraft needs to be spun and thrown out. It seems to me that if such a mass goes from the dirigible, then it will. Something will indeed happen to him at that moment. More precisely, not mass, but mass at such speed. Is it possible to create a dirigible with a speed of over 300-350 km per hour? Yes, a high-altitude, high-speed dirigible of a special design. It can carry a lot of people and transport cargo. It's just that the altitudes are different and the appearance is different. And if there are special air currents there, you need to position yourself in the current so that it helps you along. It can go even faster, up to 500. Here is a question about the serial production of the 10-tonner. Everything is in place. At least 12 units per year. There is an idea to build a vertical hangar with a vertical launch apparatus. Yes, the idea of a vertical airship somehow or another comes to mind for many people. In fact, the airship itself also suggests this. If everything here were not properly balanced, then this very balloon would want to flip over like this. Or it can flip over in different ways. It's the same story as with a flying saucer, only here it's easier to balance it. You don't need to lower the load excessively if it's disc-shaped. If you compare it with that, the airship tries to flip over like this. And you think, why not build it this way, hanging the gondola slightly here? And first of all, it definitely takes up less space, standing vertically. Secondly, it took off vertically and followed that trajectory. Next, there is a story about how it could use its wings. It can hang in the air due to aerodynamics, slow down, and descend. But again, these are all experimental things. Within the framework of the laboratory, everything will first be modeled on computers, then prototyped in the lab, and some tests will be conducted there. But all of this is just play compared to the devices that will be built first. But if suddenly some toy turns out to be promising according to the calculations, then naturally we will start thinking about its construction. Just like in the construction of vertical hangars, there is a sufficiently tall vertical workshop somewhere, for instance, near Toliati. And they say... Let's make a vertical airship there. First, a magnetic engine. And then, only magnetic plates. That's what is essentially needed. Indeed, absolutely required for the flying saucer to be complete. Where exactly is the construction of the first airship specifically planned? in the city of Moscow and its surrounding areas, the Moscow region. The first stage will begin when you raise $2 million. On Tuesday, Pavel and I discussed that there is no point in tying ourselves to a specific amount. Most likely it will be less than $2 million. Or to a specific date, since this is essentially still the zero stage. I formulated it during the webinar on Tuesday and it will be difficult to repeat now. There are certain risks at the zero stage, including the absence of a campaign. People are not organized. We don't have any presentations or anything. But a presentation is one thing. There are still the very first zero steps, up to the scientific and technical council that will take place on Monday, where we will approve the first design of the device. At that point, it will not only be about the design, but also about the layouts, specifically the engines, a lot of specifics, almost everything. By mitigating risks, we are nearing a transition. It's about what can be created, where, 
how with resources and how much time it will take and so on and so forth. These risks are precisely mitigated in the creation of risk. We are reducing risks in the creation of risks. We are approaching a change of stage. As for the finances, it would be better to meet Pavel Filipov at the webinar and ask if the finance department has a forecast on how much funding will be raised by the time we have the risks will be mitigated. It will be as if there are documents and the legal framework is correct and complete. By the way, everything is also moving wonderfully with the legal framework. Just a little bit is left. You know, in one company they gathered 10 engineers and after three months they produced a prototype of a helicopter engine. A year later it went into production. Right now, it is indeed the most widespread in the world in its class. That's truly wonderful. Here we have Ruslan, responsible for production, did the same thing, only without any financial backing. With personal funds, literally, and effort, they gathered. Well, they got together, well, he had been gathering for a long time. In short, he was involved in a lot of production, but he always wanted to work in aviation, and so every time he reached, well, there was some free time and I was designing either a plane or a helicopter a long time ago, many years. And it has come to the point that designing the fuselage, wings, tails, and so on is all very easy. But this engine, they don't sell the engine. These break down quickly. This one has its own drawbacks. This one there. The price is outrageous. The question arose specifically about the engine and he started to work on the engines. Well, simply buy aviation engines from the market, just copy them in our own production. And I acquired the skills to make engines in various ways. And now the engine, well, you see most of it was probably produced by Ruslan. He, this is a rotor. It is indeed currently on display at the Tisam Baranova and it is remarkably spinning. And not the remaining part of the engine, of course. Well, like a super, super, super contractor, after all, this order reached him, and he did it himself. The remaining engine, well, part of the work was done there. We designed and completed the remaining part of the engine ourselves, and then we modernized it in general. They assembled this engine. Since the guys are helicopter pilots, they basically built a single-seat helicopter for it. And how much did it cost? In three months, we just rode it until it got cold. Then we assembled the second one, and now we are on the third iteration. In general, we have a similar talent. And he said, Okay, let's work on airships. I really like it. In the group of various specialists, there are many different elements and aspects that I will explain later. We do not currently have a design bureau yet, we are forming something like project management, and there is a direction for power plants, which is led and managed by Ruslan. And there is, in fact, another direction associated with the near-Earth infrastructure, also him, so I can send it. I need it now, Ruslan. If watching, send in the chat the video of how your guys flew on the first helicopter, the second one, and what the third one they are building now. And tell me the deadlines. More precisely, well, it's something like six months, and there are not ten of them, but five. We've tried launching the VK600 for about ten years, but the WHO is not even there. VK600. It's probably some kind of engine. I don't have any related information in my head. It happens everywhere. The WHO is present in many places. In some cases, things work out, while in others, they don't. Sometimes there are organizational gaps, sometimes administrative issues, sometimes scientific and technical challenges, and sometimes the machinery is so inert that it's easier to gather with the guys in a garage and launch some device 
than to distribute it to institutes and design bureaus for them to work on it. If the gondola is made inside a rigid hull, the aerodynamics will benefit. By using ballast inputs, such a device can be launched vertically without any moving parts. That's right. It can be done. It is necessary. And there is no need for any moving parts. But still, to take off like in a rocket and then drive, I think, in such cases, at least let the internal capsule somehow be on gyroscopes or just on gravity. So, I'm getting back in touch. So I don't see any comments here. Overall, the questions were really interesting. It was fun to chat today. I got teased for every cool thing I said. Then they come over and say, what's up? Even for what? They show up. So, sorry brothers. Which channel were we watching? The new generation state? I will also check the solar channel now, just to see. But by the way, the questions were duplicated both there and here, so plus or minus, I think. Talk to everyone. With modular airships, yes. Very interesting. This is in response to question two. So two like this, three like that. Most likely it's easier by train. And since it's a train, it's simpler to just let them fly in a caravan. I really want to test and blow through a lot of models myself because of the modular structures. There is currently a discussion in the chat about flying cities. It is clear that this may not be a distant future, but it is still a future. And there, in any case, modular structures will be needed, which can be quickly replaced, so that everything is interchangeable. Yes, we need to calculate the shape, but they definitely have a future. But I think we will find the right shape. Maybe it will be a device with a changeable shape, why not? By the way, we had such conversations. Three years ago, we met an inventor there. Maybe you've heard of him. Ryan Mueller does a lot of interesting things. But everything there is on the edge of such fantasy, that it is extremely risky. And he was then producing such composite materials that, well, you can twist something there, it can be clamped, you unwind it, it can expand, but he, in general, he was refining it so that it could be done many times and so on. He was doing all of this for the changeable shape of his personal airship. This person dreams of building his own innovative apparatus that would compress at high speed, transform into a bullet, and then expand again to remain stationary. The idea is great, but very risky. It will all happen someday. And who knows, perhaps such modular structures will eventually come to fruition. Is it possible to create an observation deck on top of the airship? Yes, indeed it is possible. Yes, and they will be there. On the rigid airships for sure, but starting from a certain size. For the small airship, the one we will be building, we can use a rope ladder, which will be on the side here from the gondola. You can climb on it, stand on it, that's possible. You can definitely walk on it. It still rings like metal because it is under pressure. On larger ones, there are full observation areas. Yes, 
of course. Why doesn't Kirill like the idea of placing a bath in a dirigible? It would be great to dive straight from the dirigible into the water after the bath. It would be wonderful. Well, everyone has their own vision. At that age when, after dreaming for so many years about a specific creation of his, someone tells him, the gondola has changed a bit. He replied, What are you talking about? In other words, everything has become so firmly established in the mind. The fact that he calls all our proposals and just ideas flying baths is not because he specifically dislikes flying baths, but for some reason he has decided to do so. The idea of flying baths is just nonsense. In reality, it's unlikely. This is some nonsense, and tourist dirigibles, which are large airships designed for leisurely travel and exploration, are meant for the far northern regions, where the climate is harsh and the landscapes are breathtaking. There should be a bath in general, as a bath is generally considered a necessity for comfort and relaxation, and he also has a bath he just whimsically referred to them as flying machines. Mansipilina, known for its unique and innovative design, was the central viewing tunnel, strategically positioned in the middle of the shell. The main electric turbine can be placed there with the capability to draw air from the body, so even with hydrogen filling, leaks will be blown out and will not accumulate a critical volume. Why? Not. I just remembered that we recently discussed concepts of through holes, vertical inside the dirigible, where screws are placed. The thrust is created by a central hole with screws, allowing air to be drawn in from here, reducing frontal resistance and other factors. Such are truly super-revolutionary solutions. This is already for the next apparatus. I mean, not everything at once, but step by step. I think we have 200 tons. That would already be some kind of wonder of the world. Maybe even 100 tons, although 40 is also possible. In general, we'll see. Regarding the fact that helium will be expelled, not accumulating critical... Oh, hydrogen, not accumulating critical volume. Probably yes. We need to take a look, but for now, everything will still be on helium. Hydrogen is still a long way off. Moreover, making a large apparatus for near-Earth operation using hydrogen, even in a phlegmatized state, is too risky. So, friends, I will probably just be wrapping up at this point. No new questions are coming in. I lost everything on Vcontacte, including all my photos, messages and contacts. It was a devastating experience too. I don't simply understand how this works. You watch the broadcast. You look at it. You see that they appear. Comments. You close the broadcast, then open it again. There are no comments. In terms of the advertising dirigible... One could, for example, create a likeness of the famous game dirigible Kirov. In fact, I would experiment with the external appearances of the dirigible as seriously as possible, allowing for maximum freedom to make them somewhat uniform, white or grey. Of course, aerodynamics. But overall, making different dirigibles, there have already been such ideas and thoughts that, for example, if this is for various regions, well, to make completely different dirigibles for India, one for Russia, another even within Russia, one for the European part, another for Altai, and a third for Yakutia, and to make them so, that is national, to be completely different. In general, and yes, maybe some custom one, dirigible Kirov, it seems like everything is according to the game's script, I haven't played it, but... Right now, the state of things on the planet is generally like this, plus or minus the same as there. So, what is it called?
it's amusing, in general. Alright guys, that's it. Overall, I think it's time to say goodbye. Well indeed, truly, certainly. One and a half hours, questions answered. That's it. On Monday we have a scientific and technical council. If you want, I can try to do a live broadcast from there. On Telegram, for example. Or somewhere else. Well, the circles will definitely be recording. Who is sitting? What are we doing? We will shoot a big video about this. On Tuesday, there is a classic landing webinar. Basic level. The presentation needs to be revised. In fact, it's already difficult to present based on it. A lot has changed. But maybe right after Monday we will likely revise it. A lot of specifics will emerge. See you on Telegram. By the way, let me note this down. Regarding the Roslin's helicopters, send the video. Alright guys, goodbye everyone. See you on Telegram. Write to me. We'll chat there.